Hi everybody, welcome to Eric's Tech Talks. Today I want to talk specifically about wiring trolling motors. Uh, there's lots of good how-to um, videos on YouTube. There's guys that do it for a living all the time. Uh, one of the things that I think they maybe skip over a little fast, and you know, a lot of them, like I say, are really, really good, is the whole discussion about wire gauge. Um, I've got the uh, wiring installation instructions that come with the Minn Kota motor here. And uh, using my boat as an example, we put a 55-pound trolling motor on the bow. And just for practicality reasons, the batteries wound up in the back. So what we've got is 20 feet of red and 20 feet of black going between uh, the battery in the back to the motor in the front. So if I look this up and I, you know, uh, have, there, there's a table in here. And what it says is a, a 50 pound uh, or 55 pound trolling motor um, will take at maximum 50 amps. So from a standpoint of how much power we're going to lose through the wiring, um, in the case of using the recommended four gauge wire, if you want to calculate that out, there's charts on the internet, like the one that I always seem to wind up on is this one called powerstream.com. Uh, never worked with them, never bought anything of it, been using their data for years, so thanks. Um, anyways, uh, you can basically get a uh, rating of how much resistance there is in a four gauge cable per thousand feet. So then if you want to figure out what your voltage drop is going to be, uh, using Ohm's law, you can basically say, okay, take that number per thousand feet divided by a thousand. Now you've got the resistance per foot, and that's a really tiny number. And you can say, okay, now I'm going to use, in this case, 20 feet there, 20 feet back. So multiply that number by 40, because there's 40 feet in there. And then you can um, uh, multiply that by the current. So in this case, worst case scenario, 50 amps. So what that comes to, just did the math for you, um, is just under half a volt. So if I have a 13.2 volt fully charged 12 volt battery in the back, and I'm going full throttle first thing in the day with that 55 pound trolling motor, I would expect for the motor itself to see 11.7 uh, volts because we're dropping that half a volt over the cable. And of course, there's not just cable or wire in delivering the power to the front of the boat. There's also a wire harness in the motor itself. So, you know, maybe you've got a connector that plugs in and there's, you know, five feet of cable or something like that in there. Again, that sounds like five feet, but you've got to double it. So, and it's a smaller gauge. It's more like a four, or sorry, it's more like a six. So, you know, the actual motor itself now is probably getting 0.7 of a volt less than what you've got for batteries. And it, it doesn't sound like a big number, but there's two things that I'll point out. One is uh, you're losing 0.7 of a volt on a 12 volt system, which is somewhere in around the 8% of your power is disappearing. It's, it's turning into heat, which is the other point. So if you take a half a volt and you multiply it by 50 amps, there's 25 watts of heat that is being generated in the system. And this is the part that a lot of people don't, don't talk about and maybe you're not aware of. So if, if any of you have tried to change a light bulb in your house and you've got a 60 watt light bulb or a 25 watt light bulb and you're screwed it in and for whatever reason you touch that when that light bulb has been on, it's, it's warm, like warm to the point where it will probably burn your fingers. Um, in the electronics world, we design heaters all the time that are 10 watts that are 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, your oven, uh, lots of things that you use, your hair dryer, you know, not that I need one, but it, all of those kind of things, typically just to create heat, uh, put resistance in the way of the electricity. And this is no different. So 25 watts in terms of heat generation in that cable assembly, from the back to the front is probably okay. Now, um, keep in mind this is over that 20 foot distance. Now, an interesting thing happens. So I, I took the example of, okay, so say I'm trying to cut some corners here and I don't go with the Minn Kota four gauge recommendation. I go over here and I go, well, you know, maybe I can uh, get a slightly less expensive cable and I'll use six gauge. So what happens there? 
So I actually did the math already, and what happens is you now go from losing a half a volt to losing eight tenths of a volt. Uh, and then if you go two wire sizes down, so down to an eight gauge, um, you're losing one point one and a quarter volts, over one and a quarter volts on a 20 foot distance. And more importantly, now you're using up about 75 watts of power in your cable assembly. So that's that's uh, kind of looking for trouble, right? Um, so lastly, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know some of the other stuff that's important uh, very very quickly. So. I mean, if, if you go to the local uh, automotive store and you buy your, your uh, you know, hookup cable kind of by the foot, um, this isn't ideal, but it's, it's probably reasonable, is get yourself uh, tinned uh, connectors for your battery connections. So these are the ones that are silver color. Don't use the copper ones. Uh, they tend to corrode very, very quickly. Uh, when you do uh, strip uh, the wire and you're starting to put it inside, the terminals. Most of us don't go out and spend, you know, 150 bucks on a crimp tool in order to do this. So you're trying to do it with solder. So you know, get yourself either a vise or whatever the case might be for where you're heating this up, and get a, a bit of solder in there. It doesn't have to start bubbling over the side or anything else. And then put a, um, a heat shrink over top of it. And a couple of real quick tips on the heat shrink is again, most of us don't have 300 bucks to go and buy a heat shrink gun. So what you can do is you can go to the hardware store and find one of these paint and strip guns, and they generally generate quite a bit of heat. Uh, so two, two things you've got to be careful of is that you don't overheat the heat shrink and then it'll just split on you, but it'll heat it up at a reasonable distance where the glue will start to set, and now you've got a waterproof connection where that solder is, which is very important. And secondly, second thing, always be careful of the heat gun. Is it's always easy to kind of hold this up to some place where you're uh, working and start running the heat gun towards this and melt the boat behind it. So always keep in mind that you know the heat doesn't stop where you're looking, the heat keeps going. So don't set your boat on fire when you're using those heat guns. Um, last but not least, I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes marine wire different. Now, um, just from a standpoint of uh, if you want to really see why marine wire is different, unfortunately they're not doing a great job of marketing and they don't tell you on the spool. So you have to go to their website and the data sheets are all there. Uh, and so a couple of things that you'll, that I noticed being that I've you know, been involved with electronics and wiring my entire life is uh, the, the very first thing that I noticed is the specification around the insulation. So that's uh, 600 volt rated insulation which is better than a lot of the wire that you pick up. And uh, the other thing that it's, it's got a rating for 105 degrees centigrade dry, which uh, is about um, 170, I believe, Fahrenheit. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but you can heat it up pretty good. Now, uh, they rate it at 75 degrees when it's wet. So it's also designed from an insulation perspective to deal with things like moisture and possibly some solvents like the gas that it might be exposed to and things like that. So the insulation is, is much more robust. The other thing is, is that there's a very high number of little itty bitty wires in there. And uh, this uh, allows the cable to be more flexed. It won't, these won't break when you start to have them in a moving environment. Uh, don't under any circumstances, please don't use solid house wiring type cable in your boat because eventually what will happen is it gets enough vibration and the metal will fatigue, it'll fracture, that'll create more resistance and now you've got a fire hazard. Um, the last uh, thing that I noticed was not only the, uh, um, the wire itself inside it and the insulation, but they, these, these uh, products or these, these wires have also been uh, subjected to a number of different industry standards that are specific to the marine industry. So, for instance, ABYC has said, yep, yeah, we've, we've got a standard for what wire should be like, and this product meets that standard. Same with there's UL and, and CSA, and most wire has that, but this is uh, a UL and CSA standard that is, again, particular to the marine industry. So, um, Last, last thing that I'll talk about is, uh, and this is a golden rule no matter what you're doing for wiring, is neatness counts. 
So if you start yanking on stuff or you start being sloppy with your connections, uh, a good example is, is if you're uh, doing your soldering and maybe you're trying to do it in a boat rather than at a bench where you're sitting down and you can have a steady hand and stuff like that. Um, what happens is again you build additional resistance where that connection is and that's going to lead to failure or possibly some you know, additional heat or whatever the case might be. So neatness is very important. So take, your, take a minute, think about what you're doing, don't get in a rush, um, make sure the wiring that you've got goes exactly where you want it to go, try and get it up as much as possible, like in a boat like this, there's conduit runs, they're actually in the top part of the boat, so you can get into, uh, you know, lean underneath, look upwards and do cable ties to try and keep the cable out of the water whenever possible. Uh, try and keep it away from obviously oil and gas and stuff like that. Uh, but really, really, really important that neatness is part of your regimen. Um, and the guys that are, uh, have videos on YouTube that know what they're doing, that's the easiest way to tell that they're professionals at it, is when they're done you look back and go, oh, that's... Uh, that's a deadly job, it just everything seems to fit nicely and all the other stuff. Always leave yourself a little bit of slack in all the connections because again they're going to move or maybe you want to move some stuff around, maybe you reorient your battery boxes or stuff like that. So my general rule is whenever I'm going into a battery I like to give myself at least a foot of extra room just so that I can move things later. And uh, same thing at the front, so you can be kind of resistance paranoid as well. Um, and on the other hand, anything that has wiring in it, particularly a trolling motor, the main connection going into your uh, connector that you use for disconnecting the motor when you're not using it, you know, if you're not using that extra three feet or something like that, put your connector further up the cable to get rid of the excess and then you've got more voltage to play with actually at the motor itself. So, uh, just one last thing, uh, all of the companies that I've mentioned I have no relationship with. Um, I'm using their websites to sort of help everybody that's watching this. Um, there's no paid testimonials here or anything like that. I'm just doing this to uh, help and hopefully save you some frustration, some money, uh, and uh, be safer out there. So, that's it for this episode. Uh, thanks very much for watching, as always. Um, Comments are always welcome as long as they're respectful and I hope we helped you out and uh, good luck out there.